questions. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me read you a little bit before we get into this teaching. And the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow and refined aged wine, and it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited for, that he might save us. This is the Lord with whom we waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is a group of people that were waiting for the Messiah. And they knew that when the Messiah came, there would be feasting. There would be a banquet and we would all be participating. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you and I praise you for bringing us here this morning. God, thank you for allowing us to have the freedom to come and worship you. And Lord, this morning we ask that you will just teach us a little more about what your kingdom now looks like. In your name we pray, amen. So two weeks ago, we discussed that God's kingdom, it's not necessarily fair, is it? But we're okay with that. We're okay that the, the blessings fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. That people like us who are undeserving find grace and love and acceptance. That's the kind of kingdom God offers. And then we're also told last week, Jesse, by the way, did Jesse do a great job? He nailed it. He talked about the, the talents and how we are all given talents that we should be using in this present life now. And some of us, we've decided that, oh, I don't know if I should use it now. Maybe I'll wait. And God says, no, servant, use those things now. Bless the world now. Today, we're going to talk about a banquet. Everyone say a banquet banquet. Do y'all like food? Ten of us like food. I love food. I love sitting at, there's nothing better than sitting with someone and eating just really delicious food. Whether it's pho or a veggie burger. No, I'm not even going to go there because it's not good. Um, whatever it is that you're eating, whatever it is that you're eating, it's just such a nice opportunity to get to know people when you sit across from them. And so banquets were these times where in the, in the Hebrew, they believed banquets were a time of transformation. Interesting? Transformation happens at a banquet. And so here's a couple things that they believed that would happen at a banquet. Many of us, after church, we invite people over to our homes or to eat. This is not an Adventist tradition. It's a Hebraic one. You got to know people. And so here's what happens a visitor is transformed into a guest. Everyone say, ooh, that's nice. A visitor becomes an honored guest. Another thing that you understood in the Hebrew was that when you were, when you were having trouble with an individual and you weren't seen eye to eye, you would not go to them and beat them up. You wouldn't awkwardly avoid them when you see them. You wouldn't do those things. What you did, you invited them out to eat. Because here's what happens when you invite someone that you don't like or you're at odds with. We might even call them our enemy. When you invite your enemy to eat with you, here's what happens. You sit down and you can only talk about surface stuff for so long, can you? After like the appetizer, the reality comes out and what happens is that person that you saw as an enemy becomes a what? A friend. It's beautiful. Go out to eat more often, folks. Sermon, done. There you go. What did you get this week? Uh, eat more often. <laughs> okay, good. Here's other things that happen. At, at banquets, you would have these, these uh, awesome parties. At the weaning of Isaac, we have a banquet. The first miracle that Jesus performs is at a what? A wedding, which has a what? A big banquet. And where does he perform his miracle? At the banquet. All these beautiful things happen at a banquet. And so Jesus, in Luke 14, he's part of a banquet. And at this banquet, he sees a bunch of individuals who are trying to get others' attention. They're trying to get other people to notice them. They want to get closer to Jesus so that they can get recognition. How many of you have ever seen anyone that you might consider a one-upper? Show the picture, a one-upper. They wear shirts, so you know, the one-uppers. They look like this. Maybe you decided you were gonna go bungee jumping 
It's your 30th birthday. You think, bungee jumping. So you take, you, you wrap your, your ankles with rope, which is ridiculous anyways. You, you go to the edge of this bridge or whatever it is you're going to jump off of. You jump and you go, ah, ah, and you fall and you bounce and it was so much fun. And you go and you meet with a bunch of your friends and what do you want to talk about? Well, I want to talk about what happened to me. I did this bungee jump and you're talking about it. But then the one-upper comes and they stand next to you and they do this. They always do a head tilt, by the way. They go like this. The condescending grin. That's nice. And you're like, oh, great. Well, the other week, I mean, that's good that you went bungee jumping. I actually went skydiving. A lot of fun. You guys should do it. I mean, I think it's good that you, you, know, you took that first step. But if you really want an adventure, you'll go skydiving. You just got one-upped. Parents, we're freaky folks, aren't we? Um, we, uh, we do this often. Parents, our son or daughter, they'll like mumble something that sounds like what we think is daddy. And so the mumbling, we tell all of our friends in this group, will be like, hey. My son said, Daddy, Daddy. Like, oh, that's so exciting. He said, Daddy. Yeah, he's speaking already. The one upper. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. <laughs> Our daughter, Jessica, she actually is writing her first sentences. You know, six months old, we're just so impressed. She's so advanced. She's going to be working on her first novella. Already got publishers, everyone interested. But great, that, that's good that he said, Daddy, that's a start. One uppers. So Jesus experiences a one upper in Luke 14 because he realizes that there is a heart issue going on. That there are people in this group that they're, all they're concerned about is building their empire, making themselves look good, thus pushing others down. So Luke 14, verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Have you ever seen people do this? Jesus is like giving this beautiful life, breathing sermon, story, all of this stuff he's giving them at this table. And then someone says this after someone says something profound. Yeah, I totally agree with that. They put their stamp on it. It's like, okay, great. That he wanted recognition. This man is a Jewish person. He believes that because he's Jewish, he's going to participate in the kingdom. He believes because he's Jewish, he's part of an elite group, and he just naturally is better than everyone else. And Jesus, I just love it, he all of a sudden like targets in on this man. And wouldn't it be awesome to have a million stories just to bring out to people? Instead of saying, you're wrong, you could say, there once was a man. He's so interesting. And that's what Jesus does. So watch what, how Jesus reprimands this individual who's just seeking praise. Jesus responded, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. During this time period, if you wanted to throw a party, you would get invitations. You would send them out. And how many people would send them back would give you an idea of what you need to prepare for with food. So that's an obvious. It's like any party that you do. If you know there's going to be 100 people, you don't just pop open a can of veggie wham or whatever it is and cut it. You need more food, don't you? Everyone say yes. So what they would do is you would either get a chicken that would serve like two to six, a lamb that would serve anywhere from 15 to 20, you would bring in a fatted calf that could go from 75 to 100 people. And here's the deal. If, a, if, I, if I got the fatted calf and I made that and only 20 people showed up, did I have a refrigerator and Tupperware to put it in? I didn't. And so this would be an absolute waste, which was a sin to them. To waste food was a sin. And I feel the same way. That's why my plate is always so clean. And so... If you were invited and you accepted the invitation and you decided not to go, you were wasting food, which was a valuable commodity to us and them. So he invites the guests. So watch this. He invites the guests. 
Jesus says, uh, but they all alike began to make excuses. They began to make excuses. The first one said, but I've bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. In this culture, I never understood this until a little while after studying this a little deeper. In this culture, when you invite people, they accept the invitation, they come over. And there is a second invitation. The second invitation is because you're already there waiting for the food. So the person came in and said, the food is now ready. These men were already at the feast. So it'd be like this. How many of you like Thanksgiving? Yeah, you work up to it, don't we? We work up to it because we know we're going to just have this gluttonous meal and we're going to go into food coma later. And so imagine that you are in this other room, and again in, in America, to celebrate our Thanksgiving, we sit around and watch television rather than actually communicating with one another. And so we're doing that, and all of a sudden, Grandma comes out, and she says, the food is ready. And you look at Grandma, and you say, oh, thanks, Grandma, but uh, I already had McDonald's, thanks. Thanks. My grandma would take the platter and beat me with it if I did something like that. These men are already present at the banquet. The word come actually means you're already there, continue on. These men are already at the banquet. The food has already been prepared. It's ready now. And they begin making excuses. And so notice one more time, the man says, he says, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. In this culture, you didn't just buy a field and then look at it. In this culture, you would go to the field, you'd look to see how many wells are there. You'd go to the field, you'd check to see what kind of stuff grows on this. You didn't just buy a field. This would be like me looking at grandma and saying, oh yeah, grandma, I can't, I can't eat your food. I just bought a house. I gotta go look at it now. You bought a house? Yeah, I haven't actually looked at it yet, but it's, I, I should go look at it. Right now? Yeah. You might think that I might be a little strange. In fact, I think grandma is smart enough to know that I'm lying to her. I'm insulting her intelligence. Anyone reading this story during that time period knows this is a lie. You're ruining Thanksgiving. Here's more. The next one. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I'm on my way to try them out. How many of you have ever bought a car? A couple of us. What if I told you the best way to buy a car is to just send a dealer a bunch of money, trust them to get you the right car, and then just show up later and drive it around? Seems reasonable, right? Because this is what would happen when you would go to buy an oxen. The owner of the oxen he would send a message to the town and he would do one of two things. He would either send a message and tell everyone, come to this field and you can test drive the oxen. You can see how they move, check and see if there's enough cup holders, make sure there's a sunroof, see how it rides. The other way was that you could potentially, he would say, I'm going to plow my field on this day, come and take notes. And for a small community, which didn't have TV and everything else. This was a spectator sport. Can you imagine? They'd get around and they'd take notes. Oh, yeah. That one definitely pulls to the left. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yeah, it pulls to the left. It, it was weird. This is what they would do. When this man says, I just bought, bought some oxen. Now I'm going to try them out. It's an obvious lie again. It's an insult. Next one. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Most people lived in villages, 75 to 120-ish people. I just got married. Everyone in the community would have known you were married. If your marriage was taking place on the same day, the host wouldn't have done this. Also, consider this. This man is essentially saying, I went without asking my wife. Men, you follow me? That is a no-no when you're married. 
You must always talk to your partner about where you're going. It's important. Kind of important. Again, the man is lying. This is an insult. And so watch what happens next. And the servant, let's see. uh, And the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry, ordered the servant to go out. Again, I can imagine this. You do this in the Werfel household, grandma's beating you with the platter. It is not gonna be pretty. It would be more than anger that you would receive. You would never get turkey again, that's for sure. He says, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. This is really good news. He says, go out and spread this to people who are undeserving. People like you and me. Go to the people who need this the most. Go and tell them how good the banquet is. I want them to experience this now. Go and invite them back. Here's what I've seen a lot of churches. We invite people to come to church, but we're not experiencing church. We invite them to a great feast, and we haven't even touched the appetizers. We invite them to experience Jesus, but we don't even know him. When you invite someone into this community, I pray that you're inviting them into something that you are currently experiencing. If not, what are you inviting them to? A show? If it's not happening in your life now, they'll pick up on it and they'll say, this is shallow. May we be the kind of community that is experiencing the feast daily so that someday when Jesus comes again and he brings the full Monty dessert, we're gonna be like, yes! The pumpkin pie is delicious. It's delicious because we've been experiencing the rest of the meal before. Everyone say, ah, and you're hungry now. Goes on, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. I love that phrase, there is still room. Everyone say amen to that. There is still room at the table, and all of us can participate. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're this, whether you're that, The table is large and there's room enough for all of us. Verse 23, 24 says this, the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes, make them come in so that your house may be full. May our houses be full of friends. May our churches be filled with friends. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of the banquet What's sad is it's not the host that's saying you can't participate. It's the people he invited that are choosing not to. You want to know what hell is? Hell is being at the Thanksgiving dinner and saying I won't participate. That's hell. Hell is being in the middle of a feast and saying "Mm, I already ate McDonald's. Ew. On many levels, ew. Ew. There's another dimension to this I want to share with you, and it's this. One of my favorite writers says, at the table to your left, there will be someone that you need to ask forgiveness from most. At this table is someone that you must ask forgiveness from. You've been carrying around a tremendous amount of guilt and shame, and at the table, God calls us to turn enemies into friends, and it happens now. And so some of us right now, we've been carrying around a tremendous amount of guilt and shame. And God is calling us not when Jesus comes again, but to do it now. Imagine being in heaven with people you hate. It would be hell. Because you haven't actually done what God's calling you to do. And that is to eat together and restore one another. At the table on your left is the person that you must ask forgiveness from most. 
To your right, to your right is the person that you need to forgive. You have demonized them, you've hated them. Every time you walk past them, you choose to look the other direction. Well, we just don't agree on things, so we choose not to talk. It's not healthy. In heaven someday, which is supposed to be experienced today, that does not happen. We talk to one another, we love one another now. So if there is a person that you need to forgive, that is burdening you and it is killing you, it's making the food in front of you toxic. And God is calling you, he's calling you to forgive. At this table, this banqueting table, Jesus is saying it should be experienced now by all of us. It should be experienced now because in God's kingdom, the least are first. In God's kingdom, the broken find hope and the slaves are set free. In God's kingdom, the people you've wronged forgive and forget. They redeem you. In God's kingdom, which is now, the people who have wronged you are given grace and love because you have been, gra been granted the same. May we be the kind of church that is living this out now. Please stand with us as we sing this last song.